Let's let's just make a start. I don't know if anyone else is coming, but morning, Henry. I'll throw it open. Anyone's you got anything you want to to talk about specifically? Any questions you want to ask or stuff? Three views of hell, <laughs> and I I just happened to run through that this week with a friend of mine. I wasn't with him. I was just listening to him do some teaching. What? How did you? How did you come to the restor, restoration of all things? Versus, if I if I understand the first, the first one is traditional. You burn forever. Second one's, uh, you're burned up. I mean, you you annihilated, uh, yeah. annihilated. And the third one is restoration. How did how did you my how did you come to that? Well, it was a it was a process of. The closer I got to God, the more face-to-face -face encounters with God revealed what he was like. And the more I just couldn't equate what my experiences of him were in love and these views, which just didn't seem to be like I was experiencing. So I, I had cognitive dissonance. So I have these encounters. God reveals himself. Then all of a sudden I'm looking up. Yeah, but this doesn't, this doesn't line up with what I believe. So now I've got a choice. Am I going to go with what I believe or am I going to go with my experience of God and what he's revealed himself as? And so this obviously created some tension within me. Um, and I then went and said, well, okay, well, why do I believe what I believe? Where did those belief systems come from? So I go back to the Bible, and then I find that I go back to the original words that were used, and then I sort of find, wow, well, these aren't, these aren't meaning what I thought they meant. When I go back, I'm looking at them in English, and then I go back into the Greek or the Hebrew, and particularly the Greek side of it, New Testament, and so, well, this, this didn't say that. So I'm now starting to get challenged. Well, where, how do I... Where do I come to a, a, a decision? Is it going to be based on my understanding of the Bible, which was thrown into confusion by just so many words, which I believe are mistranslations of the original word? Um, and I sort of said to God, well, where do I go with this? And he said, well, you, you need to use love as the framework what you make every decision based on because I am love. And if everything that you believed does not align itself with love and the love that I've revealed to you as, then you need to then be willing to let go of those views. So I, I went back into obviously with hell found that it wasn't a, a, an actual Greek or Hebrew word. It's a German Germanic Norse word and various different views of where it came from, but one of them be it the Norse god Hele of the underworld and different things. And there were all sorts of, but it's definitely in English. We've used it in English to create an image of something. And most of what people's image of it is comes from Dante's Inferno and, you know, Hieronymus Bosch's pictures, paintings, more than what the Bible actually says. And that's what I discovered. The Bible doesn't actually say what I thought it said and what I've always been taught it said. It doesn't say that. When you go back to the original language, it doesn't actually say it. And, you know, the King James Version of the Bible will have 56 occurrences of, of the word hell in Old and New Testament, 56 occurrences. The New American Standard Bible has 13 the Young's literal translation of the Bible and other literal translation, which just use the actual words, has none. So I said, well, well what are these words? What, what do they mean? So you have um, four words which are translated in the English as hell. You have Tartarus, which is just used once. And in that one occurrence, it's talking about angels effectively uh, who have been um, 
imprisoned in Tartarus awaiting judgment. Um, so they were the watcher angels who fell uh, in the original uh, thing in the Bible at the flood, I guess, or before the flood. So that definitely, uh, and the, what it says there is they're awaiting judgment. Well, you can't torment someone who's awaiting judgment. That would be totally unfair. That's like saying, well, we're going to put these people to death before we've had the court case to discover whether they're guilty or not. So they're awaiting judgment and they're described as being in hell. Well, they're not in hell. They're in the place awaiting judgment, which is described as Tartarus or Tartaru in, in Greek. So one occurrence of that, um, I think it's in Peter. Um, so then the other words uh, are Sheol, which is the place, the grave or the pit, literally. And if you go back into the original Hebrew, it says grave or pit. If you go into a concordance or a, you know, let's say, Strong's um, concordance of that word, it will say grave pit and then add hell on the end. And hell is put there because of the understanding of the interpreter, not because it was there in the original. It had no Hebrew meaning of torment or punishment or anything else. It was where people went after they died, to Sheol, the place of the dead, the grave. And it could be just the grave in context. Well, they went into the grave, so we buried them in the grave. Well, putting someone in the grave isn't putting them in hell. The pit obviously has a, a, a meaning which is deeper. So it's, they're not just being put into the earth. They're going down under the earth somewhere. So that you have that concept. But again, you don't get the concept of punishment or torment or torture. That was added later when the Hebrews started to take on Greek culture and the Greek language. They started to adopt some other thoughts about it. And then you've got the obviously Hades, which is the Greek equivalent of Sheol. And that literally means a place of being out of view, out of sight. So when you die, you're no longer in view to the real world. And that's the root meaning. But we then have added on, obviously, Hades being the Greek god of the underworld. So that, again, has this sort of picture of a mythology to it. Um, and then you have Gehenna. And at Gehenna, Jesus used Hades, I think, about 11 times in different con connotations. Um, and then Jesus used Gehenna, I think, 13 times. And virtually every time he spoke of Gehenna, he talked about, he was talking to the religious leaders or the Jewish people who were you know, opposing him or arguing with him or everything else. And literally, it's a place, the Valley of Hinnom, outside of Jerusalem. It was their rubbish dump. And it was on fire. I'd been burning for hundreds of years because it was it, all the rubbish was in there continually burning. It's like, you know, our tire mountains today. Some of them are on fire and they just can't possibly put them out. Um, and it was also a place where, you know, the rubbish decomposed. So it was a place where they described it as where the fire and the worms were operating. And that has a history, if you go back into history, where there was child sacrifice where the Valley of Hinnom was seen as a bad place because of what they did there. They sacrificed, even the, even the Hebrews sacrificed their children to Molech in the Valley of Hinnom. And in Jeremiah, it, it's prophesied that this would be a place where the fire that would burn and the worm would eat the body. So Jesus then uses this place, which the, everyone knew. I mean, it was everyone in the New Testament who heard Jesus talk about Gehenna knew exactly what he meant. This was the physical rubbish dump. So if you said to someone like the Jewish leaders, you're going to end up in Gehenna, it was totally offensive to them, of course. So he warned them physically, if you do not change your perspective on this and follow me, you're going to end up in the rubbish dump. And literally, they did. Some of those who Jesus spoke to literally were crucified in, the, in AD 70, in the you know, uh, destruction of Jerusalem. They were put into the rubbish dump, hundreds of thousands of them. 
So that was a physical, it was nothing to do with the future, 2,000 years later. You know, Jesus meant it to them now, then. That's what he meant. It was like, this is where you're going to end up. Some of it was very figurative of your whole lives. You think you're so righteous, but your self-righteousness is going to end up, you're going to end up losing your life. So when Jesus said, you know, what does it benefit your, if, you, if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? That's what he was saying to them. What's the benefit of all your kingdom stuff, of all your self-righteous religious beliefs, if you're going to end up in the rubbish dump? So the, he was talking about the kingdom now, nothing to do with, you know, not now, this, but then to him, then now to them. He was talking to them about what was going on then. So if they were operating in the kingdom and he said well i'm going to take the kingdom away from you lot because you're not producing its works and i'm going to give it to a people who will and he saw he said well actually you know the wrath of the covenant is coming the consequences of you breaking covenant are the curses of the covenant of deuteronomy 28 which were horrendous i mean you read deuteronomy 28 well that's what happened in jerusalem they ate each other's babies i mean they were eating rats I mean, it was horrendous. I mean, they were in there. A couple of million of them were in there. Now, every Christian left. According to Josephus, there was no Christians that were left. I think they all left and they went to Perea because Jesus warned them to leave. When you see armies coming or when you see the abomination of desolation, again, language going back to Daniel and other things, run effectively. Do not even stop to get your coat run and get out now all that stuff has obviously been futurized well this is going to happen when jesus returns whatever well it didn't even make any sense thinking of it that well why would you run if jesus returns you know you know so it actually was talking about a physical destruction of jerusalem and the warning to his to all his disciples to make sure you do not get caught up into this terrible wrath to come where the covenantal curses get released because people have refused to follow me effectively. So those are the four different words that are translated hell. And none of them actually mean hell in the concept that we have in evangelical Christianity today. And if you go back to the early church, and this is so my journey in this, was, okay, I'm looking at the words. The words don't mean hell. And we've just put out a blog post on this, the hell delusion. And we're getting a lot of flack, as you can imagine, from uh, more evangelical circles and religious people, which is you know par for the course. Um, but just looking at the words, then you've got to look at Jesus's words and his using things that people have interpreted hell, like parables, and see, well, what was he talking about? So when Jesus used Hades, well, what was he meaning? And some of them are just multiplied the same story in the different gospels. So there's only one story, but it's spread over two or three gospels. So the number of uses isn't really different. It's just applying to the same thing. Um, So Jesus told parables and he told parables um, to represent uh, spiritual principles that had a meaning. So one one of them would be has been taken to apply to the life after death, which would have been hey, Lazarus and the rich man. So the rich man, he's in, he's in Hades, uh, although it doesn't say that. You know, again, it, it doesn't use the word hell or Hades. It just describes the rich man who is in torment. Uh, and then it describes the poor man who's in Abraham's bosom. Now, what Jesus was saying was, you know, He was trying to illustrate the reality of rich and poor and what the what they're what they were supposed to do with poor people. They weren't supposed to take all the money for themselves and not help anybody. You know, so he was he was making a point. And if you take it, you know, if people take this literally as a literal story, well, Lazarus has got a name and therefore it must be a literal thing, it can't be a parable, they don't realize that Jesus got that story. He didn't, he didn't make the story up. He used the story that they already knew, knew that came out of Babylon. And it came out of the writings when they were in Babylon. So it was borrowed 
from another tradition. And he used it to make a point. And the point was nothing to do with what was going to happen after death. Because if you follow the story, you all rich people are going to be in hell. And all poor people will be in heaven. Well, we know that isn't true. You know, so you, you've got to look at the, what was the point of the parables. And who is he talking to? Most of the time to the Jewish leaders. So even when you read sort of things which seem really obviously talking about the future, you've got to realize that he was talking to them about their present. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the future. And most, I mean, I'm not a futurist when it comes to biblical interpretation. So most of what Jesus was talking about was relating to AD 70. And actually most of what the New Testament was talking about was talking about AD 70. There was a warning of what was to come, the end of the old system. So be ready for this persecution. Matthew 24, obviously, is the classic thing which has been projected onto the future. Well, Jesus said very clearly, all these things will come on this generation, which was that generation, not the race, but the generation. And it happened. And it says it won't ever happen again. You know, so that's really what I started to do. I went back, looked at all the scriptures that Jesus used, all the parables, all the things that people have been using to illustrate this eternal conscious torment as what hell is. And I very clearly found if I'm actually looking at it without the confirmational bias of my belief systems, it doesn't say what I thought it said. So I am now open. I believe in this process that, okay, well, where am I now? I've gone back to what I used to believe and realized that there isn't a foundation for what I used to believe in the Bible, which is where I thought it came from. So, okay, if it's not in the Bible as I thought, well, what is? What, what does it say? Um, what does it mean? You know, and what did Jesus do about it? And why would people go there? You know, so essentially, I, I then looked at um, asking God and engaging God around, well, what is all this about? So some of it was a, well, you, are, you're re you used to read this in a futurist context. So revelation, obviously, is the other big sort of thing where the lake of fire and death and Hades thrown into the lake of fire and the lake of fire being created for the devil and his angels, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but there are different ways of interpreting that. If you interpret it from a futurist perspective, then you're going to read that as, well, in the future judgment the, of the great white throne, that we're all going to end up being assigned someplace, whatever. Um, but a lot of people will interpret, you know, particularly from a reform background, a lot of people are, are from a preterist or partial preterist view of scripture and revelation being mostly completed or all completed. Therefore, therefore, they would say that the lake of fire is the same thing as Gehenna. It's a description. And they would say that the devil and his angels and the devil is not a there is not a Greek doesn't have a capital D for devil. You know, <laughs> Dalabolos. It just is a word which means accuser. Same for Satan, Satanos. It, it doesn't actually necessarily have to be a person. Because it isn't personalized in the, in the scripture, it's just written, and it can mean accuse, accuser. Um, same for Diabolus, adversary is the actual meaning of the word. And other places in the New Testament, it isn't translated as a person, it's translated as adversary, when someone was against somebody. So even there, you can say, well, it may mean something else. There are other possibilities that it could mean. So... Looking at it then, it was like, okay, well, what does it mean? You know, so from a preterist view, the devil, the, the accuser or the adversary and their angels, and angels again can mean messenger. Angelos means messenger. It doesn't have to be a supernatural messenger. It can be any messenger. So you could say that the high priests and the Pharisees were those that were opposing and adversaries to the gospel and Jesus, and therefore it could easily be seen as the high priest and the Pharisees and all his messengers 
that we're talking about. Not a personal devil or a... Per now, I'm not saying it is or it isn't. I'm just saying there are multiple different ways of interpreting this. And then when you look at the original words themselves, fire, what is fire for? Now, the annihilist, annihilation view of, well, everyone will be annihilated and that's it, they just die. That view came because people couldn't, couldn't reconcile a loving God with someone who was going to interpret or torment people for a, a, forever on the basis of what they've done for 70 years. In no one's justice would that seem just. Okay, these people, they never heard the good news of the gospel. They lived out somewhere in the jungle, never heard of Jesus, never, but they're going to be tormented because it's just tough luck. And for if you're really extreme in Calvinism, you'll say, oh, well, yeah, but God just created them to be out there because they were going to be punished anyway. So he just stuck them out the jungle because there's no point them here in the gospel because they were going to be punished anyway because God didn't choose them. Well, I definitely don't believe in limited atonement. Jesus died for everybody for all time, as far as I'm concerned. So you have all these different views. Fire, P-U-R, in Greek, purify. Purification, that's where the word comes from. Pyro, pyromaniac. Pyro, but the root is the same root as used in purification or refining. Purifying. So fire can be purifying. It doesn't destroy, actually. The fire does not destroy anything. It just changes its form. You burn wood and you get ash and smoke. It still exists. You burn something and it still exists in a changed form. So it says in, in Malachi, you know, I think, was it Micah, I'm one of them, that, you know, that Jesus is coming or the Lord's coming like a refiner's fire and a fuller soap to purify. He's coming to his temple. He's coming, you know. And there's this sort of sense where fire in the Bible often is seen as refined, the coals of the altar, you know, the, the purifying coals of Isaiah 6 and the seraphim being the burning ones. So again, the words don't have to be interpreted the way we think. The word torment or torture. Again, the word itself, the root of it is testing as by fire. It's a metallurgy word. It's, it's a technical term, torture, as in used in Revelation in terms of, well, they're going into the lake and fire to be tormented or tortured. Actually, the word means to be tested like a testing stone to see whether it's pure or not. That was the original word. And it's been adopted to mean torture because it was about fire or purification or testing. So even that has other meanings. You know, there are other meanings that are there that doesn't have to be interpreted through the normal meaning that we've presumed to be true because we've all believed in this infernalist way. So then, then I looked at words which again were mistranslated. And again, if you look into a literal translation of the Bible, you do not get forever or everlasting or eternal. Those words do not exist in Greek. They're English words on based on all variations of the word enios, which actually means age enduring. There's nothing in it which is an eternal or an everlasting or a forever and ever meaning. It means age enduring or ages enduring, which is a different thing. So even some of the scriptures that people say, ah, but it says this is going to be forever and ever. It isn't there in the original Greek because that word has been mistranslated into an English word because they thought it meant something. Even eternal life is not talking about the qu quantity of life. It's talking about the quality of life. And when it's related to God, it's talking about his quality of life that we can have, not the age of it. So, you know, John 3.16 is not talking about the, that we will have this, life that will never end in context it's actually talking about we can have the quality of life of jesus now in relationship with him so i discovered so many you know 
misinterpretations, confirmationally biased things. So then I looked back to the early church and said, well, what did they believe? These are the guys who were closest to Jesus and closest to the disciples who, dis who were discipled by Jesus. What did they believe? And they had, I think, six different theological schools during that time uh, in the sort of second century. Um, and uh, you had various schools of belief. Only one of them had any sense of torment, punishment. That was the one which was the Roman school who got their understanding from the Roman version, the Latin version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. So they were, and that were Tertullian and Augustine, eventually Augustine were all in that school. They didn't like Greek. So they used Latin. And so they totally misunderstood again, the actual meaning of the words that were written and interpreted them through their Latin thing. And then you've got Jerome's Vulgate Bible that was produced, the Latin version of the Bible, which was used from the fourth century, I think, all the way up to the King James. And it basically, all the other versions sort of came out of that. A lot of them were, were out of that, that sort of message, which was Tertullian's and Augustine's message. And if you look at them in their lives, particularly Augustine, the guy was racked with guilt and shame and condemnation his whole life because he couldn't overcome sexual sin. So he had this view of God because he felt so guilty that God was punishing him because of his guilt. He didn't have a revelation of the love of God. And he, with the Roman Empire, with Constantine, obviously taking the Christian faith, making it the, the state faith, they started taking that with the legions out and making people convert. So they came into the UK with Roman legions, and basically they put to sword a whole load of the Celtic believers who had believed the gospel, and now they were being forced to come into the Latin version of the gospel. Uh, and that, of course, came with punishment and torment and whatever else. So I think when I first started to look at it, I, I found that the early church didn't believe in any form of eternal conscious torment at all. It just isn't there. Um, and they didn't believe in penal substitutionary atonement either, which to me is the foundational truth that leads to all these other things. Because if you believe that God's wrath, anger against man was appeased by Jesus as a sacrifice and God killed Jesus, then you have this view of God that he's angry and he needs appeasement and that that atonement was an appeasement for his anger. And so I, I looked at all that and, and I think God really started to really challenge me over that view because I'm talking to him and he's like nothing like that in my relationship with him. And I've struggled with, well, how can you be this angry God in the old Testament and this really, nice Jesus in the New Testament. And it's like, well, I'm not. Even the Bible says I'm not. The Bible says Jesus was my express image. He represented me fully. So what he was like, I'm like, well, how can that be true? The Old Testament is full of you doing this and doing this and doing this. And, and he said, well, go back and look at what it says. And you find, A, it was written by the victors of every thing. And they all attributed their victory to the fact they were doing things on behalf of God. And B, every time it apportions God wiped out this group or God did this and he brought his judgment and punishment on this group. You say, you see written there, because the Greek, the Hebrew, the Hebrew idiomatic form of writing attributed things to God. That was how they did things. It always states, actually, that God took his hand off. God removed his protection from them so that they actually suffered the consequences of their walking their own way. And you see that continually through the Bible. AI, there's Jericho. They're doing what God says. And here's AI. Oh, well, we presume now we've got this 
great authority. We'll go and take this little place. And they got routed because they didn't do what God said. They took on their own strength. So then you get the judges. How many times does Israel go back to foreign gods? And what happens? God removes his hand of protection on them. They get conquered. They get occupied by the Philistines and the Ammonites and all the other ites and all those stuff. And then what happens? They turn back to God. What does he do? Welcome them back. Send them a judge. Give them victory over and over again. You know, and I, I think when, when the whole understanding of substitutionary atonement uh, from a penal nature got dealt with, and I believe in atonement and I believe in substitution, I just don't believe it was penal. So I don't believe it was retributive or punitive. It was restorative. So Jesus died our death. Well, who killed him? God didn't kill him. We put him on the cross. Mankind put him on the cross. The religious and political system that wanted power and control put him on the cross. And God even used the worst torture that they could invent and he even turned that around to bring good out of it all because that's what God's like. He's a loving God, you know, and therefore God did not forsake Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is another keystone to penal substitution atonement. He didn't. That was obviously Psalm 22. And if you read Psalm 22, verse 24, I think it is, it says that God hurt him. And responded to him. He was crying our cry. He was totally identifying with fallen Adam. And it says in 2 Corinthians 5.19 that God was in Christ reconciling the whole cosmos to himself, not counting any of their sins against them. So if God doesn't count their sin against them, how can he punish them? How can he punish anybody? So all these things started to contribute to the process of realizing how loving God is and God's desire that none would perish and all would come to a knowledge of the truth. So then all these scriptures about God's desire to restore things, to reconcile everything, to bring everything back into relationship with him made total sense from my, my own relationship with him and the things he was talking to me about. So, once I'd realized that, okay, hell is not a biblical word. The concept of hell that we have attributed it is also not a biblical concept, Old or New Testament. Then I'm left with, well, what does happen to people after they die then? <laughs> it's just like, what happens? You know, well, I do believe in free will and I believe cho people can choose to separate themselves from God if they choose to. I don't believe he's ever separated from us. There are people who have this, well, God can't look at sin, therefore he can't look at sinners, therefore they're separate. God loved the world, you know, everyone in it and everything in it. So I don't believe God's ever separated himself from us. We've chosen to walk our own way. We chose to walk on the path of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. God didn't tell us to go and do that. All he did is stop them accessing the tree of life in the garden. But they could have gone through the cherubim and the fiery sword if they'd chosen to. Because what did God say when they messed up and they were hiding in the bushes, covering up? Where are you? Not what have you done so I can discipline you and punish you? Where are you? I'm walking in the cool of the day here looking for our time of fellowship and intimacy. And you've gone and where are you? Well, of course he knew. But he wanted them to say, oh, well, we're here, but we're coming to you now. And they didn't. They said, we were afraid and we hid ourselves and we're covered up. Yeah. So now we're doing our own coverings. We're doing our own thing because we're now appeasing you. We're covering up our shame and our nakedness and we're appeasing you with our own fig leaves and everything else. So, you know, you have a huge disconnect between what the early church believed, what the Bible actually says, and the concepts that we have adopted as, well, this is obviously the truth because we've all bought that because it's what everyone believes. And it's the orthodox position because it, everyone's always believed it. But when you go back and look at what they believed in the Old Testament, they didn't believe it. So it's an evangelical perspective, mostly a Protestant perspective, 
um, which you know, was accentuated by Calvin. Penal substitution, Yatoma as a technical term, only existed in, I think, in the 11th, 12th, 10th or 11th century with Anselm of Canterbury, who developed the term and the terminology, who was very influenced by Jerome's Bible and by Augustinianism and Tertullian, who was a very nasty guy. I mean, if you read some of the things that they were saying, anyone who disagreed with him to him was going to be cast into the torment of God's fire forever because they disagreed with him. It was, it was re- he was a really, na- really nasty guy. And that's what the root of some of this thing of God is because he didn't like people. And particularly anyone who disagreed because he would call them a heretic and he would call them to burn in the flames of hell forever. You know, because he was angry with them. Well, what did Jesus say that we were to do with people who were angry with us? Forgive them. And even on the cross, when they're killing Jesus, his response is, Father, forgive them. No, no repentance required. Just forgive them. And he did. And God reconciled everyone, the whole cosmos, to himself in Christ, in what he did on the cross, not counting their sin against them. And we have this message of reconciliation. And what have we used evangelistically a lot? Fear. Turn or burn. If you do not love God, he is going to torture you forever. Well, who would want to love a God who's going to torture people forever? That's like me saying to, let's say I was, I was uh, here's, a, here's a girlfriend and I wanted to propose to her. It's like saying, okay, I want to marry you. But if you don't want to marry me, then I'm going to torture you forever. Well, you wouldn't really get too many people who were saying, well, that's the sort of guy I want to spend the rest of my life with. And I think the same applies. The world is rejecting this God that we have presented to them as this angry, appeasing God who will punish them if, if, the, if they don't toe the line. So then I get to this point. OK, so what happens to people? And then, you know, Romans 2, I think, talks about it's the kindness and the tolerance and the patience of God that leads people to change their mind about him and them. Nothing to do with, again, repentance is another English word, which comes from the Latin penance. So keep doing penance and redoing penance and I'll forgive you. So that's the way we've taken it. Uh, you need to be sorry and you need to make amends because God will forgive you. And if you don't, he won't. And we've used that word. So it was this, and what it really meant was is metanoia, which is with mind. So when you are with the mind of God about yourself and him, you will have a completely radical shift. And it's his kindness, tolerance and patience, which will lead people to have that radical shift of mind, not fear or punishment. So then God loves everybody with kindness, tolerance, and patience. And he's wishing that none would perish, live in that lost identity, but all would come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what it says. You know, that's his desire. And it's, it's his desire. It's not a wish. The word wish isn't there. It's, it's, we put wish in, but it actually doesn't mean that. God desires. He wants everyone no one to perish so if that's his desire and he's kind and tolerant so when people then die and they don't yet know him that then suddenly changes a god who's tolerant patient and kind wanting none to perish to this god who will torment and punish and torture people forever so our death changes the nature of god which is that's what that's really saying. If God's like this before you die, you die and all of a sudden God's totally different. Because tough luck, you didn't accept him. Now he's going to show you his real face and he's going to punish you and torment you and torture you in the flames of hell. I mean, I saw someone the other day writing to rebuke what we put out as a post. And they said that they had this vision of God, hell, in which... People who didn't, didn't accept the love of God were going to be continually raped forever. I mean, seriously. I mean, it was just, I'm reading this like, ah, oh, and you're saying this is, this is the nature of God? 
Oh, it was terrible. I mean, I, I mean, I didn't respond because I'm just not going to get into debates over this stuff. But I felt so sorry for someone who thinks that that's what God's like. So then I started to look at, well, OK, if God hasn't changed after we die and he's the same God, well, is he not going to continue to give people the opportunity of choosing to accept him as Lord after they die? And does physical death end choice? And I came to the conclusion I couldn't find anything in the Bible that said physical death ends choice. And so I threw this out to a few infernalists to see what they would say. You know, have you got a scripture that says that death is the end of choice? But when people physically die, that's it. They have no more ability to choose to accept Jesus as Lord. And they couldn't come up with any. So I thought, well, if, if those that actually believe that that's the case can't come up with the scripture to say it's the case, then there probably isn't one. Now, the only scripture they did throw up, which is the one I was expecting, was, you know, the Hebrew scripture. You know, it's appointed man wants to die and then the judgment. Well, there's nothing to do with that with punishment. And actually, even will wants to die appointed, when you look at what that means and the context it was written again between old and new covenant, it doesn't mean what they were saying it meant anyway. So I, okay, came to the conclusion, and this came in conversations with God as well. It wasn't just my, I think I've got an understanding of it. I asked him, and he was talking to me about it. It talks about every knee and every tongue will bow and confess that Jesus is Lord. You know, so it's just like, okay, well, what does that mean? Is that forced? Well, I can't accept that it's forced because I believe God's given us the choice. So people can choose to be separated from him. So what happens to them after they die? What is the fire? Because I've been to the fire. I mean, I had visions what I would have called hell, but I was seeing fire and I was seeing people in anguish. What was that? And I came to the conclusion in talking to God, he is a consuming fire. So people their souls go to a place of consuming fire. What is the fire there to do? To consume everything which is hindering them coming to a decision to accept Jesus as Lord, not to punish them. Now, are they in a very nice place? No, man. It's like I've been in the fire of God's presence and I was physically quaking from the fire of God's presence when I presented my scroll to him. And I knew the love of God powerfully. So if you don't know the love of God, to be in the fire of God's presence, it produces anguish of soul. Now, people could say that is torment, but it's not God's torment. It's you being tormented by the fact that you had 10 choice, 10 ways of accepting Jesus and you decided not to. That's anguish. I don't need to be here. I'm here because I chose to be here and there was all these ways I could have got. Now, at some point, people will have an opportunity of choosing to accept what Jesus has done. Now, Jesus went there and preached. He went to captivity, went into Sheol. He went into what was called Abraham's bosom, which again was not not a, a biblical term. It was a term out of Babylon but it it represented paradise. He called it paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise, which was into the grave and into the place where those who did believe and had a relationship with God and were accounted as righteous like Abraham and Moses and others, that they actually, Jesus went to them. And he also went to those who were imprisoned. It says the spirits who were imprisoned and he preached the good news and they responded and he led captivity captive and as a sign of that hundreds of them came out of the grave and wandered around jerusalem te- testifying and witnessing to the resurrection and then they all go back up as the cloud of witnesses with jesus into heaven when he goes back into heaven because that's what he went up in not a normal bit of wispy cloud he went up in the cloud of witnesses so jesus went and preached there A lot of, of course, what he was talking about before the cross was before the resurrection. 
So after the cross and the resurrection, some things did change. Like there was no Sheol with two parts anymore. Because he led it all. Everything that was captive there, he led them out. So I'm in this place where I'm having all this stuff going on. I'm really struggling with it. I'm just like, oh, you know, I would could do without this really. But I have no choice because God is unveiling his truth. He's revealing this stuff. I'm seeing the truth in the word of God. Therefore, I asked him, okay, if this is the case, if everyone who dies without knowing Jesus goes into your consuming fire, what happens to them? I asked the question. And Jesus took me there and showed me. So he took me into Satan's trophy room, first of all. And I'm looking at my area of heritage, my family lines, four family lines, looking at them. And Jesus is like, do you want to engage with this? And I'm thinking, I don't know what you're talking about, but yeah, I'd love to see my family line. I want to see my heritage back. It was purely selfish, really, because I just wanted my heritage that I never had. And I thought I was going to get it all, you know. So he says, well, let's go through the door. And I said, what door? I'd never seen a door there. been there before. I'd never seen a door. He said, that door. And I'm like, why didn't I see that? He said, well, because you couldn't see it, because you're blinded by the fact that you didn't believe it existed. So we go through the door. He gives me a silver trump trumpet, and we engage my father's father's generational line. And they're there in fire, in the fire, and they're in anguish. And I'm standing there thinking, Jesus, what do I do? You know, and he's not saying anything. So eventually I preached a feeble message. I mean, it was terrible, really. But I didn't know what to do. I was overawed by the experience. So I preached the message of the love of God. I preached Jesus, you know, as, and I basically told them they didn't need to stay there. They could accept Jesus and they could come out. And Jesus walked out and I followed him, figuring I'm not staying here on my own. <laughs> so I followed him out and I blew this trumpet. I think, well, he gave me, I better do something with it. I blew it. And we followed that. We went back up through this fiery tunnel, out through the fiery sword door onto wisdom sites. Jesus stands, turns around and a few hundred people followed us. And they got to the fiery sword, the door. And they kneeled and they confessed Jesus as Lord and they walked out through the door and they walked into Zion. And I'm standing there with Jesus and I'm looking and I'm, I said, what have you done to me? How am I possibly going to explain this? And he said, well, you just tell people that I did this and I told you to do everything that I did and greater things. So this is just the beginning. This is not the end. So I'm like, okay. So if anyone says, well, you can't do that, I said, well, Jesus said I can, and Jesus did it. And so then I said, well, why didn't everyone come out? I would have thought, even at the most feeble presentation of the gospel, no one would want to stay there. Surely they'd want out if they had an opportunity. So he said, well, the, the authority you have to preach there is proportional to the amount of fire that has been applied to the generational lines in your life. So I thought, okay, if you want me to go back here, I'm going to need some more of the fire of the, of the altar, the coals. You know, where Isaiah said, you know, I'm a man of unclean lips, I am amongst the people of unclean lips. And he wasn't just talking about the present believers. He was talking about his generational lines were the same. So I have been back there numerous times. Um, I've been back there with some specific things to preach. When I was on the fire, you know, several times I had some specific things to deal with and I went back and preached the good news. I realized the more and more I went there, that you know the scripture where it says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I think it's in James. You know, and it's like, I realized that I'm preaching to fragmented souls. And some of them are double-minded, triple-minded, quadruple-minded. They are fragmented in parts. And they can all respond to the good news because they're broken. Uh, and some of them don't like God because of the things that have happened to them in their lives and they blame God. So I, 
I went back there last year in, in December in this very specific encounter. And I thought, I need to preach wholeness and peace. So I thought, well, I'm going to ask Jesus to come with me as the Prince of Peace. I'm going to ask him to be able to, to give me the authority to be able to speak to every part of someone's soul. And I preached a really powerful message of healing and restoration from fragmentation and brokenness and, and reintegration and wholeness in the Prince of Peace. And I just gave them uh, a, a call to come into the Prince of Peace. And I mean, just so many responded to that. And they came and they engaged and they were integrated and whole in their soul and they accepted Jesus as Lord and they came out of that place. Now, I'm not the only one who's having these experiences and encounters. Lots of people are. Nancy Cohen, people like that. They are having these type of encounters. Other people, I'm not going to mention the names because they may have not publicly said this. So I'm not going to put them on the spot, but I'm talking to them and I am... Uh, I know that they have the uh, same experiences and they have the same beliefs. They're just not necessarily willing yes to come out because of the potential stuff that happens as a result of this. But I believe that the love of God and God is love and he doesn't want anyone to perish. Now I'm not going to be labeled with a name on this. You see, people will start calling you a universalist. Well, it doesn't matter about preaching the gospel because if everyone is going to be saved, then what does it matter? We might as well just let it all happen. And therefore all roads lead to God in the end. And so, and I'm not, I'm not there. Jesus is the only way to the father. No one can come other than through Jesus. He's the only way. No other religion will enable people to come to the father. Only Jesus. I'm not a Christian universalist either. Because a Christian universalist will say, everyone will be saved, guaranteed. Now, I don't understand why people wouldn't want everyone to be saved. And it's my fervent hope that everyone will eventually respond and say, Jesus is Lord. But I can't guarantee that because they've got free will. They can carry on resisting that call to accept Jesus for as long as they want to. I sincerely hope they don't. And that desire or belief that people can make a choice even after they die does not in any way diminish my desire to preach the good news or see people come into their salvation here and now and find their relationship and become discipled and part of God's kingdom here and now. Why would I ever want anyone to go to a place of fire which will mean being in a place of anguish and tormented by them their own decisions and choices but not by god nowhere in the story of lazarus and the rich man do you find god even mentioned as being there it just says that he's in the flames well i believe he is in the flames he was in the flames and the same flames are there now the flames of god's consuming fire in fact the fire of his love because he's passionate about his children he wants all his children to have a relationship with him and fulfill their destiny in the ages to come so i i i have no issue with this lining up with the biblical understanding of jesus the father god god be in love and i don't find these other views can reconcile with god being love you know, do I believe in God's justice? Absolutely. God's justice is based on what Jesus did on the cross. Everyone can receive salvation. That's what God's justice is. So everyone died in Adam, all died in Adam. So everyone who followed the path of Adam has died spiritually. But all are made alive in Christ. All are made alive in Christ. And it doesn't say all in Christ are made alive. It says every, all are made alive in Christ. So everybody is made alive through the resurrection. Most people just don't know it. They don't know what God has done already to reconcile them to himself, not counting their sins against them. Colossians says that every accusation made against us has been nailed to the cross. 
Now that isn't just an accusation against me. It's an accusation against everybody. Jesus died for everybody on the cross. He died everyone's death. We've all been co-crucified with him. Just most people don't believe that yet. So they're still believing the old way of thinking that we're separated from God. So they live separated when they don't need to. They can come and experience the message of reconciliation and be reconciled to God. Come back to him because he's already reconciled to you. He's already made it possible for you to come back to him because he's reconciled the whole cosmos to himself. So we can then come back to him and discover he loves people and he's longing. You know, it's just like the, you know, the prodigal in the story of the prodigal son. Did the father say, right, tough luck. You know, you've wasted your inheritance. I'm going to torment you and punish you. You're going to stay in the pig's will forever. No, he was waiting with open arms for his son to come back to him who'd wasted all his inheritance. Well, you can't tell me that it doesn't mean everybody, all God's children, it does. So he's wanting to welcome all God's children, but all God's children have to come to him. And if they don't come to him, he's still waiting for them to come to him. He's not going to say, that's it, cut off day. And he's still waiting them to come for him, even after physical death. So the three views of hell, mine's definitely restorative. It's definitely not retributive or punitive. I don't see the cross as retributive or punitive. I believe it's dealing with the wages of sin, which was spiritual death. Jesus died our death, so we do not need to die. And therefore, everyone is now alive. Spirit, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? You know, death itself will be ended. Physical death will be ended at some stage. You know, now, spiritual death is ended now through what Jesus did on the cross. You know, and I know people will come up with all sorts of arguments. Most of them are misinterpreting what Jesus said. And if this was such a big issue, do you not think that people would have been preaching in the early church and in the New Testament and Paul would have been preaching and Peter would have been preaching and John would have been preaching? You need to turn to Jesus or you're going to be punished forever. None, none of them say it. None of them actually directly talk about hell, fire, judgment like that in the New Testament. There's a couple of scriptures that have been used to purport that one about talking about the wrath of God and avoiding the wrath of God and all that stuff. But actually the word wrath can also be translated passion. You know, so even those scriptures and, and I, in, you know, in the, I did a seven part series of this and I went into every, every possible scripture in the new Testament, that may be referring to this and gave an alternative explanation, which is just as, alternatively possible as the one that people are taking and much more lines up with the nature and character of who God really is, who wants no one to perish. I just, I'm not at that point where I'm saying this has to be automatic and everyone who dies ends up in a relationship with God automatically. They don't, they have to choose and they have to choose to come through Jesus and through embracing the cross and that victory over death, that they can receive life. Um, so, yeah, it's been quite a journey on this. And, you know, and I don't take it lightly. And I've been through the experiences of going there. So I've seen it. And so I generally ask people who hold a different view, the penal substitution atonement view. You know, someone contacted me a few weeks ago and sort of said, you're removing the cornerstone of the Christian faith. You know, that this penal substitute term and, and you are emasculating God that he can't be angry anymore. And I'm not, of course God's angry, but he's not angry with us. What's he got to be angry with us over if Jesus has already died for all our sin. He's angry with everything that's robbing us. He's angry with everything. His wrath is poured out on everything that's stopping us coming to the knowledge of the truth. Every hindrance, every obstacle, every lie, his anger and wrath are poured out on that. They're not poured out on me or anybody. Jesus died our death, so we do not need to die. Yeah, and therefore, we offer life. 
we offer abundant life to people with a ministry and a word of reconciliation that we're trying, we're drawing people back to that relationship. Now, how do people think that we can preach a gospel of fear if perfect love casts out fear? Now, I totally accept that God so wants a relationship with everyone, he will use everything possible to get that relationship. So if someone preaches fear and someone responds to it, he's going he's gonna to accept them and welcome them. Although it may not be his number one best way of doing it. He'll, people on their deathbed have visions of Jesus turning up before they die. He'll take that. He'll and if people have to choose to go into the consuming fire of his love and presence, he'll take that and he'll still offer them a way out. A friend of mine, um, you know, I was talking to him online like this, and he said to me, I, I, can I talk to you? So I said, well, yeah, sure. He said, well, I had this experience. I was in heaven the other day, and some of my family came up to me. So I said, oh, Oh, right. And he said, and he said, I said to them, I didn't know you were believers. And they said, well, we weren't. So he said, well, well, how do you get here then? He said, well, Jesus came to us and he preached a message to us. And he reminded us that you used to say, and all my household will be saved. And we responded to his message. And now we're in a relationship with him. So, and I said, well, yeah. I, I can totally validate your experience because I've had similar experiences myself. And a lot of people are afraid of coming out with their experiences because they're afraid of being shot down and accused of being heretics and being in big hot water with the religious traditional institutions, which, yeah, unfortunately that does happen. But I had, once I came out of the closet over this stuff, if you like, which I did in the Vision Destiny series 2017, you know, I wasn't really intending to until I really taught it. Um, I People started to contact me to say thank you for, for sharing this because they were afraid, you know, A, that they were, they'd lost the plot, or B, they were just afraid because no one, no one, they didn't, couldn't talk to anyone about it to, to validate whatever they'd experienced. And they were so thankful that someone had at least come out and said, look, this is this is the story. This is a journey, and lots of people have been like that, you know, since. And so many people, if you have a face-to-face -face relationship with God, you cannot fail to go deeper and understand His love more. You know, and it's that thing. So when whenever people object to this, one of the first things I would ask them if I would get into any discussion with them, and I'm not going to do that online with people, but so if someone asks me genuinely, I'll say, well, where do you, why do you believe what you believe? And where did it come from? Where did that belief system come from? And majority of them will say it came from their upbringing, their church upbringing, their Christian, uh, you know, discipleship or whatever. So I would say, so you did not get this truth face to face with God. God did not reveal this directly to you. Well, no, it came through this, and they'll point to some theology book or they'll point to some message that someone taught. I said, well, I've met God face-to-face, -face, and my face-to-face -face encounter with God is not going to be trumped by some theological system or belief that I've actually looked at, critically looked at, because I believed it myself. I'm not going to go back to that when God has revealed himself in a totally different way. I have to go with that encounter. Part of our problem is we venerated the Bible to make it almost the fourth person of God. And it isn't. It's a book. You know, and that book isn't God. And it can't possibly contain everything about God. But most people's understanding about God has come from a book, not a relationship. And as soon as you get outside of the book into a relationship, which that book reveals, of course, and unveils to us, once you have the relationship, you don't talk to God through a book. He talks to you face to face, intimacy, fellowship. 
walking in the cool of the day, being refreshed with God again. And that for me and that experience and those are people who are having those experiences, very few of them are having a problem when you realize, reveal this loving God who wants everyone to have an, a relationship with him. You know, it seems really strange to me that people would be saying almost with glee, that they are ha very happy for the majority of people to be tormented forever. As if that would be in any way a sense of justice after what Jesus did on the cross. You know, but I'm not here to change people's minds or trying to get them believe what I believe because that's up to them and God. They have the, everyone's got the right to their own view and their own opinion, but I, did not, I want to encourage people not to lean onto their own understanding, but to pursue God for themselves and whatever they believe in their life with God is to get it from him. him. You know, so I'm not out to try and convince people to change their minds, but I, I'm out to try and encourage people to go and have a relationship with God, which will really reveal what he's like, that will unveil that so that they can really meet the real God and not the one which we have presented by religion. You know, sadly, religion has presented the angry God that most of the world has turned away from. Whereas when you know him in relationship, you're presenting the loving God who willingly died in our place, dying our death so we could receive abundant life. You know, I think that message with an encounter with the living God will reach people much better than this angry, retributive, punishing, tormenting God who loves his children but will punish them if they don't get it right. You know, that isn't the God that I know and I've met, I don't think. So, so there you go. You had quite a lot with that answer. <laughs> wow. But to be honest, it's like without giving you the full picture, I could only just sort of say, well, yeah, I, this is the view that I hold to. But I, it's a journey. It's been a journey for me to get there. Right. I didn't get there no. just by suddenly one day deciding, oh, I don't like that. I'll just, I'll just dispose of it. I went right into this. I discovered there are lots of other people out there as well who are on the same journey and they've written some really good materials. You know, we've got links to that material as well, you know, but ultimately you can read every bit of material out there, but you're only really going to get confirmation of the truth from the truth himself, which is Jesus. That's the only way we're really going to know what the truth is, is engaging the truth, not our understanding of the truth, not our theological perspectives of the truth, but him, the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I've engaged the truth as a person, he's revealed himself as nothing but love. And of course there's justice. Most justice gets outworked here. The consequences of sin of a, of a fallen identity and the behaviors that associate with that are damaging that's why god doesn't like it mm. it hurts people it hurts us you know so it's not that people get away with anything and i think this is another thing well those people should they shouldn't get away with this stuff and and of course you get all sorts of stuff from well what about hitler and what about stalin and what about these people well what about me god doesn't view me any differently than anybody else he sees everyone through jesus because jesus died for everyone on the cross so yeah those people no doubt will face the justice of realizing what they've done and that will be the biggest justice realizing that everything they did and every bit of damage they did and every person they killed was done out of their broken, lost identity. And having to come to terms with that, would you, I wouldn't want to come to terms with anything. Even the things I've done, when I face the, the judgment seat and my scroll and the wood A and the stubble, even that was terrible. Sense of regret and realizing that I'd missed so much and realizing the motives of my heart were, were not pure all the time. And it was just like, oh, but 
but I knew the love of God and I knew God loved me and purified me through it. To not know the love of God and have to face, facing all the things that people have done, their decisions, their choices, and realize that all of those things are from the DIY tree. Mm -hmm. And people can remain self-righteous and argue that they can, that that stuff is self-righteously okay for as long as they want. But God's love will never give up and will never fail. And no one can be separated from the love of God. I mean, that's very clear from Romans 8. You know, no one, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing that's created can separate us from the love of God. And we're created. So we cannot separate ourselves from the love of God. When you read Romans 8, you know, 20, 30, 29 to 38, whatever, that, that whole passage, it's like, it's so clear. But if God is for us, who can be against us? The accusations cannot be against us if God is for us. Well, is he not for everyone? Or is he just for a few? The few lucky ones who happen to respond to the good news. No, he loves everybody. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank it you. It doesn't man. excuse them, though. It doesn't excuse people's behaviors. And most people are actually living in what people think of hell now. Not knowing God, not knowing God's love, desperately trying to earn their own self-righteousness self-worth value esteem all through doing stuff and and realizing that it will never ever meet their needs diy self-righteousness can never meet a need for wholeness or peace or mm -hmm. relationship only god can only jesus can and finding a relationship in jesus brings us into a whole different understanding of god's love for us and the wonder of our dad, who is a wonderful dad. You know, I don't have to fear my dad. I honor him. I respect him. I'm in awe of him at times, but I'm not going to fear him and be afraid of him. You know, I'm not going to be afraid of my dad. And yes, my dad disciplines me. Why? Because he corrects me and he trains me to become more like him, but he doesn't punish me if I get it wrong. He helps me learn from my mistakes and we even weaves my own mistakes into his redemption story and he redeems it all. That's how loving God is. Wow. Thank you. Great. <laughs> okay. Well, it's been a bit of a one subject time, but yeah. you know, but it, it's something I just feel is so important for the world to hear the good news. I just don't think most people's version of the good news is very good. And I think that's why most people are rejecting it. Uh -huh. they, need the, they need to encounter God genuinely in love. Uh -huh. you know, and, I, and I think even our preaching of the gospel has been preaching at an intellectual level. As in, you know, the gospel good news, if you believe this blindly, without even knowing God, then you'll be saved. Whereas no one in the Bible was saved or had a relationship with God, which wasn't a relationship. The disciples believed Jesus because they walked with him every day. They weren't asked to believe in someone they didn't meet. Yeah. We need to be introducing people, the world, to the real God. So when they meet him, wow, they will discover how wonderful he is. So asking people to pray a prayer, do an altar call, although, yes, God will take it, it's not what he intends. He wants to reveal himself to people. I mean, I love the story with Paul where he has this encounter on the Damascus Road, and in Galatians he described it as that God was revealing that Christ was in him. Mm. And then when it was like, well, why are you kicking against the goads? Why, Paul, are you resisting what I've been doing in you to try and disciple you? You've been resisting it. And I've been at work in you all this time. And you've been operating with your own blinded mindset of your self-righteous religious rituals when the truth is in you. The light is in you, wait, waiting to be revealed. And now it's like, okay, Lord, who are you? But I'm Jesus. So I think, I think, that's the, the way God wants to reveal himself to people. 
mm. as already at working people. And we need, therefore, to stop telling them they're separated from God and telling them that he's already done everything to make them alive in him. They just need to discover it. Mm. I think that's a much better presentation of the gospel. Mm. You know, people didn't ever even do altar calls until the 19th century. Mm. Go back to Wesley and Whitfield and guys like that. The power of God showed up in God's presence and people were weeping, having met God. That was mm. what turned them to follow him. Not a message of intellectualism without any reality behind it. It's like, I remember reading the story of Wesley and he was preaching this message and this lady was wailing and crying. And the guy, one guy said to him, well, can you do anything for her? He says, God already is. What more can I do? God's meeting her. Hmm. We need to help people meet God. Then they will know the truth of who he is. A loving God who has given everything and held back nothing. You know, it says in Romans, if God gave his only son, how will he hold back anything else? Hmm. That's how loving he is. Was Finney the one who brought out the mourner's bench? Yeah, because they, they sort of brought out techniques, mm. you know, uh, and then sort of it became, then the sinner's prayer. They didn't have a sinner's prayer. Mm. You can't find the sinner's prayer in the Bible, in the New Testament. Yes, it's drawn from a couple of scriptures, you know, sort of Romans, if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart. You know, there are some scriptures, you know, but actually the faith that we have to believe is not something we have to generate and try to believe when you meet God, you don't have to try to believe you met him. You believe he gives everyone the faith to believe. Yeah. You know, you've been saved by grace through faith. That's not the gift of your, uh, you know, that's not your own. That's the gift of God so that you can't boast that I saved myself through this amazing belief I had in God. It's a gift. Well, God must have given that gift of faith to everybody so that everyone can believe, but everyone's got a choice whether they actually do believe. Mm -hmm. And the way we preach the gospel today, I think people aren't believing because they're not really encountering God per se. Mm -hmm. and he wants people to encounter him. Everyone, Moses encountered the burning bush. You know, there wasn't just this sort of letter sent to him with this, well, I'm, I'm sending you to Egypt. There was this amazing experience. Abraham, yeah. leave your country and your family and go to where I'm going to tell you to go. Well, that was an encounter with the living God. You know, not some blind faith, just believe in this God somewhere. Everyone in the Old Testament encountered God. Noah walked with God. Enoch walked with God. You know, they all walked with God. David had such an intimacy with God. You know, they, it wasn't just theoretical. The prophets heard the voice of God or saw the reality of God. Mm. So we've got to get back to, I think, it, introducing people to the real God, mm. the God of love, mm. the God who's given everything for them and wants a relationship with them and will never leave them or forsake them or fail. Yeah. They just got to realize that they need to turn to be reconciled to God. God's already reconciled them to him, but we've got this ministry of reconciliation. We've been given the word of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And what have we done? We've twisted it and made it the world of separation. We've been preaching separation to the world. When Jesus gave us the word of reconciliation to the world mm. oh, powerful wow yeah i better leave it there okay brother <laughs> thanks for